Hey, Senior Camp 2020. Evan Jones here, youth pastor of the Gallatin Church of God of Prophecy. So glad you could join us online tonight for the devotion on daily bread. I look forward to taking a deeper dive into the Word of God with you as we continue to go through the theme of this year's Senior Camp, hashtag Breathe and Restore, as we follow along with the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. So tonight we will be focusing on Matthew 6 verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. So let's go ahead and pray the Lord's Prayer together as we start. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. So what comes to mind when you hear bread? Of course, literal bread that we eat. We all have a good picture of uh, somewhere we love to eat bread when we go out to eat, um, which it's been some time since I've gotten to do that. But the first thing that comes to my mind is, hmm, Texas Roadhouse rolls fresh out of the oven, baked with the delicious cinnamon butter. Hmm. That is a... Uh, too good, right? So we have the literal sense of bread, but what about spiritually? We see here Jesus pointing out God's desire to meet our needs, right? He desires to meet our needs, not wants, but our needs. That's the heart of the Father. The heart of God wants his children to learn to depend on him alone because he is our sustainer and provider. One of the names for the Lord is actually Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide or the God who provides. So he is our provider and sustainer. He alone can satisfy and meet all our needs, no matter what, physically, check, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, he's got us covered. So when we say, give us this day our daily bread, we're really inviting the Lord to meet our daily needs, which he alone can meet. We can't meet it. We have no control over meeting our own needs. But when we surrender to him, when we pray what Shelley taught us on in the previous verses, surrender ourselves. Ask the Lord for his will to be done, not my will, but your will, O Lord, be done on earth as it is in heaven, and my heart as it is in heaven. We're inviting the Lord to have control. We're depending on him. And then Jesus encourages us in verse 11 to ask or request that he give us this daily bread. It's something he provides. He loves to give and come through for his people. But also bread is symbolic to what in the Bible? Anything come to mind? To me, when I hear bread, I think of the word. Literally, the word is the bread that we're to feed on, this holy scriptures. We're encouraged to meditate on the word day and night, to store it in our hearts that we might not sin against God. So when we feed on this, we can regurgitate it. It creates a relationship with God that we're living in communion with him, a daily devotion, a daily walk with the Lord. Right? So we see the bread is also the living word, the living bread. So I ask, do you view the word as spiritual nourishment for your soul? You as an individual, do you view the word of God is spiritual nourishment for your soul, your body, heart, mind, and spirit. 
we even see going back a few chapters, if you were to stay in the book of Matthew, in chapter 4, in verses 1 through 11, is when Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. You may be familiar with this story, but if not, this is after Jesus had came and been baptized in water by John the Baptist, received the Holy Spirit, and then was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights. And there he encountered temptation by Satan head on. We see Satan tempt him, right? Jesus is probably weak and hungry as he's been in this desert, in this wilderness, fasting and praying. And Satan says, if you be the son of man, hey, here's some stones. Can't you turn them into bread and eat? But Jesus responds with the word of God. He responds with the scripture stored in his heart from memory in Deuteronomy. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan even goes on to try to use scripture against God in the flesh to try to cause Jesus to sin. But we see again, Jesus counterattacks with the word of God, with the sword of the spirit. So that's the importance of hiding the word in your heart, because even the enemy the accuser of the brethren, the accuser, the tempter of the brothers and sisters will try to use the word of God against you if you don't know it correctly. So it's important that we get into the word. We get into this word until the word gets into us. So being spiritually nourished is vital, right? As we talk about bread and as we talk about daily devotion. So going back to my question, do you view the word as spiritual nourishment for your soul? So just as we need daily food to sustain us, we need the daily word of God to sustain our spiritual lives. And notice the emphasis on the word daily, daily bread, daily devotion, daily walk with the Lord. It's not all at once. If he gave us everything he had for us at once, one, we wouldn't be able to take it. It would just be too overwhelming for us. And secondly, if he gave it to us all at once, we would surely mess it up. But we see here, viewing the word of spiritual nourishment for our souls, that the word of God feeds the spirit of God within. Right? Jesus promised his Holy Spirit, the helper, the advocate, the comforter, to all those who would believe in him. So we have this promised Holy Spirit within us as believers in Christ and followers of God. So the word of God feeds the spirit of God within us and the Holy Spirit fuels the man or woman. And then where we'll spend the rest of our time tonight, what is the bread symbolic to in the Bible? It's symbolic to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the living word. The beginning of the gospel of John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. In the beginning was the word. Then it goes on in verse 14 to say that the word was made flesh. So literally God came in to the flesh, came to live here on earth in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. So the word being bread, so you have the living word and the living bread recorded in John chapter 6, which is where we will hang out for the rest of tonight. We'll be in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me in the Word of God, to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I hope you're turning. I hope you have a hard copy of the Bible in front of you. Hopefully you're watching on your smart device, and yes, those are powerful. You can use the YouVersion Bible app and many resources there, but there's nothing like having the hard copy, the hard Word of God to hold and hold dearly and to open and let the Holy Spirit illuminate the Scriptures to you. So as I give a background as you turn and get in John 6, in this past season of life, I've just, I've really been gravitated to the Gospel of John, really going back to late February and early March. um, I'd been reading and rereading through John's account of the Gospel as we were leading up to Easter. And as I was reading, something or someone, thank you, Holy Ghost, um, 
really stopped me dead in my tracks in John chapter 6. And it's funny to me, you know, at least sometimes, how the Lord works. You know, there's no coincidences in the kingdom of God. My One of my good friends says that often, that if God had a middle name, it'd be coincidence. Um, but I originally planned on preaching about the bread of life as my first sermon um, as youth pastor at our local church on the last Wednesday in March. But for some odd reason, everything got shut down. And it just so happened that I was asked to do tonight's lesson on daily bread. So thank you, Jonathan, for being obedient and asking me to share. Uh, I'm certainly not worthy. I don't feel worthy. Um, I can think of many other people that are more deserving to have the opportunity to share. But I'm honored and privileged to be able to share from the Word of God with you. And I share this background, please understand, not to boast about myself, but to boast in Jesus Christ. And to show you how much he cares and that he always is working. He always has a plan for you and your life. Um, and this is also something, it's just one thing that I'm learning really early on in my walk with Jesus and in the ministry is that as we tend to minister to others and want to share the good news of Jesus with others and we receive a word from the Lord, um, Oftentimes, you know, I believe I must share it ASAP. Like, as soon as I receive this word, as soon as the Lord gives me this revelation, I've got to go flood the walls of Facebook or I've got to go preach it immediately that minute. And while absolutely sometimes that is the case, um, don't hear what I'm not saying, but while sometimes that is the case, often God is speaking to us in his word um, Either one, individually, he's speaking to our hearts to point out something in us, um, or he's saving it, right, it, for an opportune time, for such a time as this, if you will. And when God does this and we're obedient and give the freedom to the Holy Spirit to guide when we share that word, the reason why is because the Holy Spirit wants to minister to hearts that are receptive to hearts that are ready to receive the gospel with all readiness, right? Just as we physically don't want to labor in vain, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to labor in vain either. So I pray that your heart is receptive tonight. So if you will, John chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 22 through 35. Verses 22 through 35 in John chapter 6. But just to give you a background of where we're at in 6 and kind of catch you up in this gospel story, is that one of Jesus' most famous miracles had just happened in the beginning of chapter 6. Right? Jesus feeding the 5,000. Hopefully you've heard of it, know a little bit about the story. But, um, right, he's ministering and then all these people he's been healing and performing miracles and then all these, he's gaining this following and this crowd of 5,000 come and they're hungry and he says, ask the disciples, what do we have to feed them? And they're like, you know, it'll cost us a fortune. We won't be able to do this. And then a young boy comes up and says, I've got uh, five loaves of bread and two small fish. And the Lord multiplies that. He blesses it and gives thanks to God and feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Emphasis on bread. Then, well, one last thing on that. That account of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is the only miracle mentioned in all four of the Gospels. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four mention the uh, feeding of the 5,000. So followed right after feeding the 5,000 is another memorable or famous miracle is Jesus walking on water. So that's where we're at as we catch up here in verse 22 on the following day. So John here is about to record the first of these seven I am statements that Jesus used to describe his divinity, his divinity, who he is, that he is God in the flesh, by ways he fulfilled either the Old Testament promises to the Jewish people or simply to describe himself in ways to help people understand who he is. 
that he's not just a prophet, that he's not just a teacher, but that he is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the promised king. He is God in the flesh. So verse 22, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Or teacher, how did you get here? So we see here in 24 and 25, they're, they're curious, right? Like he didn't get in the boat originally when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, but he's over here. There's only the one boat. It's not making sense to them, right? They don't have, you know, we're blessed that we live on this side of the cross and this side of the New Testament to have these scriptures and to know these stories. But at this time, they didn't realize the miracle of him walking on water. That was only between him and the disciples. And here in verse 24, you notice at the end of 24, it says they were seeking Jesus. All right, and that's a good thing. That's always an admirable or good thing to be known for as one who seeks the Lord. Um, but they aren't seeking after him for the right reasons. Um, they're not seeking after the heart of God, but after the things of God. And Jesus is about to call them out on this in verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Basically saying, dude, you're coming for the free food. You're coming for what I can do for you. Not to know me, not to have a personal relationship with me, not to learn from me, not to feed on the words that are life that I have to give you, but you're coming because your stomach's were filled because you were consumed with food. You were self-indulged and you're coming so you can do more selfish desires of the heart. He goes on to say in 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. So that's a promise, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. So we see there, Jesus really encourages us, do not labor, do not work for food that perishes, for food that does not last, right? We very easily can work our life away. I know most of you are still in high school age. Some of you may be getting ready to go to college. You're working your whole life to get this piece of paper. And why do we get that piece of paper? To prove that we've learned something and that we can be productive citizens of society so that we can go to work and get a job. And then we work our life away before you know it. We try to sustain ourselves. We try to uh, be successful according to the ways of this world, which we were never meant to do. So instead of working for our daily needs, it's easy to start working to meet our selfish wants and desires. All right? Most of you are old enough to drive or getting ready to start driving. We can all relate to that dream car we want, right? Mine was always a, a Rolls Royce Phantom. For some reason, I was, I don't know if it was when I was in your age and watched some rap videos and saw the doors and I just had it I don't know what it is and you have your own vision of the car you want and it's just like that just like a snap of a finger we can get caught in pursuing this facade of this American dream that we never have time to get around to know God the creator and sustainer of our souls the only one who can provide our daily needs 
there quickly becomes all these things we want, we have to have. We need it to gratify our flesh, to feel who we are. We get consumed in the things of this world, saying things like, oh, I gotta have it, or I deserve it. I deserve that. I've worked hard. I deserve this. Or he or she has it, so why shouldn't I? As soon as you hear yourself saying those things you've lost, you're done. As soon as you start comparing yourself to others, you've already lost. That's why it's said of others, right? That we were lost, that we may be found by Jesus. You know, our identity can easily get lost before we ever even realize it's gone in the first place. And when I was in high school, when I was in your age, you know, sadly, I have to say, you know, my identity was not in Christ alone. It was in sports, baseball. Um, it was in good grades, keeping up a, this persona that I had it all together. It was in others' approval. It was in doing good in sports and school to get the approval of my parents or my friends. It was in my counterpart, right? The female being, ex being obsessed with the female body. Um, and girls, it can be the same way with the guy, your identity being in your boyfriend. Um, so if your identity becomes lost in something else or someone else, it will lead you to do things contrary to the word of God and his righteousness, to his standard and his will for your life. Understand this, sin always, it always takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. And you can trust me on that. Please hear what I'm saying. Don't feed your selfish desires, but surrender yourself to the Lord that he may then meet your need your inner needs that he knows and can fulfill alone. You don't have to learn the hard way. We're guilty of saying, oh, everybody has to, you know, learn on their own. And that's true in some cases, but please don't learn the hard way. If you're going down this road, stop. You can stop. That's what the Holy Spirit for. He convicts us of our sin, and then we're made aware of it so that we can repent of it. We take it to God and we turn from that. Repent means to turn, to turn from the way we're going, the way that leads to death. And he's holding the keys to life, waiting for you to invite him in. Back to the word, verse 28. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Then Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. So that you believe in me, that you believe in Jesus. Again, right here in these two verses, we see this thing that's over and over through the Bible, especially very prevalent in the New Testament, this works versus faith. The Jewish people asked, how can we get in on this miracle working thing? Because I can see a bright future if I had that kind of power. But listen, there ain't no we in this. It's he and his name is Jesus Christ. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't work your way into a right relationship with Jesus. It's simply by believing in him that you are saved, that you have the eternal life that the good news is all about in the here and the now. It's not some faraway place. The kingdom of heaven comes into you. It's in the here and the now. Hallelujah. Help me, Lord, as we finish. We simply believe in him. We believe he is who he says he is. But they're still not getting it. They're still not satisfied. Verse 30 Therefore they said to him, Well, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers, our ancestors, ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
stuff there. I would love to spend some time on this, but we just don't have the time tonight. But for some homework, go read Exodus chapter 16, where it talks about this manna and how you can see Jesus being for the fulfillment of this Old Testament prophecy of the true bread that would rain down from heaven that we're now reading about. So Jesus goes on to tell them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He is the bread of life. Food costs money, and it lasts only a short time and meets only our physical needs. But God offers us free nourishment that feeds our soul, that sustains us. And how do we get it, you may ask? If you still hadn't got it from what we've talked about tonight, if you're still not understanding how we get this free nourishment, this free gift from the Lord, first of all, you come. You come before Him. You're here tonight. You're still listening. You did the first thing. You came. Secondly, you listen. You get into the Word of God. You listen to it. Then you seek the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you call upon God to forgive you and save you. Because God's salvation is freely offered to all. It's offered to everybody. But to nourish ourselves, we must eagerly receive it. We must receive the free gift that he is offering us. His broken body, his poured out blood, his life over death, this free gift of salvation is for all who would believe. As we will starve spiritually without this food, as sure as we will starve physically without our daily bread. Just as bread must be eaten to sustain life, Christ must be invited in to our daily walk to sustain our spiritual life. May we all continually hunger and thirst for righteousness that our soul, our body, mind, and spirit may be satisfied. God bless you as we close in prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so amazing. You are so awesome. Just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your word that is alive, that goes forth and produces whatever you please. It does not return unto you void, but it accomplishes where you sent it. I pray that your word has gone out tonight and landed on hearts that are receptive to the gospel. Lord, I pray that others would say as the psalmist says in Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's an invitation to come unto you, to try this and know that we'll like it because you have the words of everlasting life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you, King Jesus. Lord, you are so awesome. You are so wonderful that you fulfill our daily needs, that you know our needs before we even ask. But I pray that you would be patient with us as we learn and grow in our faith and grow in our daily walk and daily devotion with you. That everyone here, these young people, ages 15 to 18 at senior camp and all who may be listening online tonight would put their faith in Christ. You tell us simply believe, believe on the name of Jesus, that if we believe in our hearts and that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes unto righteousness. And it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. Lord, thank you for saving our souls. Thank you for sustaining our souls. 
Thank you for your daily filling of our physical needs, our mental needs, our emotional needs, and most importantly, our spiritual needs. May we continue to learn as we go through the Lord's Prayer something, some things that we will carry with us the rest of our lives. We love you, Lord Jesus. We trust you. We worship you alone as our sovereign God and the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's in your name, King Jesus, that we pray. Amen.